Thank you very much. So uh, it's a very boring sound sounding title. Uh, hopefully the talk will be more interesting than that. It just sounds like a thesis or something. Uh, so I'm uh, Anthony Pecarella, as, uh, as he said. I'm the uh, director of production uh, specifically for browser games uh, at Congregate. Um, I have been working with Congregate for five years, which was right about the start of when we added virtual goods purchasing uh, to the site and have helped grow that to be uh, over 80% of our revenue at this point. I also, in my uh, nights and weekends, am an indie game designer. Uh, I founded uh, Level Up Labs. Uh, we're probably best known for a uh, tower defense role-playing game hybrid called Defender's Quest. Uh, and then I also uh, worked on a uh, MacArthur Grant-funded uh, educational game about cell biology called Cellcraft. So uh, I've been working in the industry, but also doing some uh, indie game design uh, on the side. To give some perspective uh, and context of where these numbers are coming from, uh, sorry, there we go. Um, Congregate is an open platform for browser-based games. We were originally Flash only, but at this point, we uh, have a really good penetration with Unity. We also have HTML5 and Java games. If it plays in a browser, we're interested in it. Uh, Unity in particular has gotten up to a, you know, almost all of our users have Unity already installed. So there's very little friction uh, getting Unity games onto the site. We have a couple thousand Unity games. So uh, Unity and Flash are both really, really good for us. We have about 15 million monthly unique visitors on average. Uh, we actually peaked at almost 20 million recently, but generally uh, that's, that's the number that we're looking at. Uh, something that's a little unusual about us is that we're not a casual site. Uh, we're actually much more of a core gamer um, demographic. So we're 85% male, and our average age is about 21 years old. These are Xbox owners, PC uh, gamers, uh, PlayStation gamers. And so because of that, the genres that do well with us are a little bit different. Um, they're the more core genres like uh, MMOs, role-playing games, tower defense, collectible card games, shooters. Can everyone hear? Okay. Um, and uh, so these are the genres that our data is going to be coming from. So keep that in mind as we're, we're sharing the data. Uh, we do have a platform level virtual currency called creds that players exchange for uh, in games for in-app purchases and we were acquired by gamestop in july of 2010 and that's our new logo all right uh, we also very recently uh, in the last few months uh, became a mobile publisher for, uh, still for free to play games and still focused on the core uh, demographics uh, we launched uh, tyrant unleashed by synapse games it's a uh, sci-fi collectible card game and then um, a uh, Russian developer, uh, Lingplay, created uh, Sheep Happens and, and published with us. Uh, it's a, uh, an endless runner that has a lot more style and charm than pretty much any other endless runner out there. Um, so those are our two live games. We have another four that will be launching in the next month or so. Um, so we're really starting to ramp up on the, uh, the mobile publishing side. We work with developers from all over the world, uh, both small and large, uh, that have all managed to find really good success on the Congregate platform. So uh, this might have been a better title for the talk, How to Succeed on Congregate. Um, we have collected data from hundreds of games over the past few years and have looked at trends and patterns across them to try to understand a little bit more about what makes free-to-play monetization work. Uh, when we work with the game directly, we, we do try to provide one-on-one uh, -on -one advice and analysis, but for this talk, we're going to look at uh, you know, broader trends, um, trying to understand you know, what's going on there. Uh, we're going to go through some highlights of lessons learned um, and advice that we've designed. If you've seen other talks, you'll recognize a few slides um, that we've done, but this is the first talk we've given in Kiev, so uh, we wanted to make sure that we hit some of the, uh, uh, the more important highlights that we've, we've done in the past as well. Um, and this is not unique to Congregate. Uh, you know, a lot of this advice will go across platform, including over to mobile. Uh, it is you know, especially for the core genres, there are some cases where more casual games will monetize a little bit differently, so that it's important to keep in mind um, as you're uh, looking at our data. Other uh, thing we need to do is get terminology down, because this is, this is important as you look at data. Uh, all stats are lifetime, so when I say average revenue per user, I mean from the life of that user to today. Uh, so we're not looking at monthly, we're looking at total. Uh, how you define a user or player is very, very important. When you're talking with someone and they're giving you their numbers about, um, you know, they have you know, $10 per user, 
how they're defining that user really, really changes that number. If they're defining it you know, just by hitting the Facebook permissions page versus accepting the permissions versus completing the tutorial, all of these are potential definitions of a player, and they substantially skew your numbers. Uh, for us, a player is a registered user who just loads the game page. It doesn't matter how far they get into the game. If they hit the game page, that's a player for us. Uh, ARPU, average revenue per user. ARPAPU is average revenue per paying user. Uh, a play we define as a game session. So if you load the game up, that's a game play. And uh, occasionally I'll use the term Eastern European um, fairly broadly to mean Russia, Estonia, uh, Poland, and Ukraine. There are, of course, a lot of other countries in Eastern Europe, um, but they're actually not very well represented. Uh, we don't have many games uh, from developers there, which is one of the reasons I'm here. So uh, if you have some great games, uh, please come see me. Uh, even if you're not from Eastern Europe, it, you know, we want to talk to everyone. But um, you know, hopefully we'll get more representation uh, from this region as well, because there have been some really great games uh, that we have already. So let's take a quick look at Congregate's games. There we go. Uh, so this is one of our kind of famous bubble charts. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the user rating. So users can give games a rating uh, from 1 to 5. Uh, I, I should say these are our um, you know, games that have virtual goods in them. We have about 70,000 games on the site, but only a few hundred uh, sell virtual goods. But this is where all our revenue comes from. Uh, we generally consider at least a 4 to be a really good game, uh, but you do see some success even down in the 3.7, 3.8 range. On the y-axis, this is average revenue per user. Um, this top dot here is actually supposed to be up around here. Uh, it's, it's nearly $10. That game is just ridiculous. Um, but I moved it down because you couldn't read the rest of the chart um, when it was so high. So. Um, and then finally, the bubble size is the relative revenue. So you can kind of see which games have been uh, the most successful. So David Chu, that was supposed to do this talk, uh, does a really great talk where he combine, or he ta looks at design principles between uh, Asian developers and Western developers, and uh, does a cool comparison. I'm not going to go too far into that, but just to kind of highlight the differences here, uh, the blue dots are Asian developed games. Uh, the gray are the rest of the world. And you can see Asian games tend to push a little bit higher on the average revenue per user. There are some interesting reasons for that, and I recommend checking out uh, David's talk if you want to find out more. And just for um, interest's sake, uh, we can also highlight our Eastern European games. Again, it's only about a dozen. It's a really small sample size. Um, but we see some of them starting to get some good sized dots, starting to get some good revenue. Um, they are, so far, the ones we have have been a little bit lower in average revenue per user. And I'll actually touch on why that might be the case uh, a little bit later in the talk. So uh, let's start with one of the most core principles for a really successful pre-to-play game, and that is having some sort of role-playing game elements. Uh, that can be fairly broad. Uh, it doesn't have to be literally role-playing. Uh, the important part is that you have progress over time. Uh, it can be leveling up, improving your skills, building up your account. Um, you know, anything that gives the player a feeling of investing in the game and seeing improvement come out of it and a return on their investment, be that time or money, whatever they're putting into it, they want to feel that it's growing and improving. Surprisingly, this is actually more important to a game's revenue than having multiplayer in it. So we did this study uh, where we broke up our games, and we're looking at multiplayer and single player and splitting it out by having you know, role-playing and non-role-playing game elements. And what's interesting is if you look at these middle two rows, the single player games that have role-playing game elements in it monetize better than multiplayer games that don't. Like that sense of progress and improvement is absolutely critical. Now, of course, Having both is by far the best. That's where you get up to your you know, 50 cent revenue per user, and you know, the top games are doing far, far better than that. Uh, but never overlook how important it is to have persistent progress that the player can invest against in your game. Uh, I will say we are, I'm going to put up a bunch of numbers over the course of this talk. Uh, we will, of course, be uploading these slides. So if you miss some of the numbers, you can always go back and look and di dive a little more into them. And I say that before putting up this ridiculous chart uh, that I can't go through in, in full detail here, um, but I want to point out a couple of things. So long-term retention is really, really important. Uh, this chart breaks each row is a player category, so based on how many times they played the game. So the first one is you know, players who only played once and then bounced. Uh, after that, 2 to 10 plays, 11 to 50, all the way down to players who have played at least 500 times in this last row. Now, as you would expect, the more times a player plays a game, the more likely they are to spend money and the more they're, they're going to spend. But what is really interesting is just how much. This last column here is what percent of the total revenue for our, in this case, it's our top 10 multiplayer games that we're looking at. What percent of the total revenue comes from the players in those categories? And if you add up these bottom three numbers here, that's over 90%. 
90% of all revenue in these games is coming from players who have played the game at least 100 times. That is a lot of gameplay. And that's what you need to be aiming for if you really want your games to succeed. And if you look at this last number here, 62% are coming from players who have played over 500 times in the game. These are players that are really, really invested, that have built a relationship. And you want to think about you know, your game as a relationship with your players. This is their hobby. This is part of their social life. This is what they're spending their time and their money on. And they need to keep coming back to feel like it's worthwhile. And once they get to that point, they're happy to spend money because this is what they do. You know, some people, they golf and they go and buy expensive golf clubs and pay for greens fees. Or they go out to nice restaurants. Whatever your passion about and your hobby is, you're willing to spend money on it. And for people who are playing 500 times, your game is their hobby and they're happy to spend money on it. But the game has to be deep enough and interesting enough to get to that point. So what are some ways that we can help get players to that point? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I jumped a slide. Uh, further into that um, point, spending happens over time, especially for the best games. So here we've split out our multiplayer games from our top 10 games and the rest of them. And you'll notice it's not a question really of just getting more volume into the games. It's how the games monetize. Com if you look at so the bottom, row, uh, bottom uh, dark line is our you know, everything but the top 10 games. And for those games, once you get about a month out, this x-axis here is days. So this is six months, 180 days across. Once you get about 31 days out, the average spending user has spent more than half of what they're going to spend in the game. All right, it starts to flatten out. They're not spending a lot more over time. For the top games, it's almost linear. It just keeps going, right? This lets you even without building more um, audience, just maintaining the same audience, your revenue just keeps going. While for the rest of these games, if we don't keep pumping new players into it, the revenue slows down and eventually starts to stop. Um, so it's really, really crucial that your game not just keeps players around, but provides interesting content for them to continue to spend on. Because they are happy to do it as long as there is something there. And that theme will continue to come up throughout this talk. So how do we get to that point? How do we keep players around? Well, one start is to keep players busy. So on a per session basis, if you give them a lot to do, they're going to stick around, right? They're not going to run out of things to do. Uh, this is a game called War Tune, uh, published by R2 Games on Congregate. If you haven't played this game, you really should, because you can learn a lot from it. It's uh, been a tremendous success, both with Asian audiences and Western audiences. Uh, and that's a crossover that doesn't happen very often, um, but this one did it really well. You'll notice the screenshot is, it's tremendously busy. There is so much to do in this game. Uh, you can play with against other people, against other people, on your own, cooperatively, against big bosses. However you want to play this game, you can do it, and you can do all of it. So the game sessions tend to be very long. You, you can play quick if you want. You can also sit around for a few hours. So they have really great engagement on a per session basis. After that, they start encouraging you to come back on a daily basis. And they create this gameplay loop that is very clear. When I come back, I know what I want to do. Well, how do I know? They're actually just ridiculously ex explicit about it. Here is your daily task list. So when you come into the game, you see this list of things to do. And you know, so every day you know what you want to do. They reward you. On the right here, you actually get better rewards for completing more of these tasks every day. And it lets the game get you into areas of the game that they want you to. So they're incentivizing you exploring the game, seeing more of the game, and doing it on a regular basis. And you're getting these great you know, prizes out of it. Beyond that, they actually have these uh, daily events that run at particular times during the day. And players will come back at a specific time because they want to engage in the, uh, the raid boss or they want to be in the battlegrounds. So there's this great daily loop where players keep coming back to engage in this kind of content. OK, so now we have long game sessions. We have great daily loops. What about the longer term? Well, that's where new content comes in. And this is really, really crucial. We did a survey uh, of lapsed big spenders. So these are people who spent a lot of money in a game and then stopped. And we were trying to figure out why. 64% of them said they stopped playing and spending money in the game because they ran out of content. These are people who have spent, you know, in some cases, thousands of dollars in the game. They've accelerated through the content as one of the benefits of spending money, and they ran out. It's a game they love. They spent thousands of dollars in this game, right? Clearly, they like it. But they ran out of stuff to do. What are they going to do? And the good news is 70% said that they would come back if there's just some new content. So there's, there's a fix here. It's not easy to produce new content, but it is very important. You generally want to aim to give players something new to do every roughly six to eight weeks. That's a pace that is usually maintainable for a developer, but it's often enough that the players will feel like 
it's a game that's growing and living. There's new stuff coming out. If you wait and do it every six months or 12 months, yeah, it's going to be a really great update, but you're going to have lost a lot of your momentum. And we see some games that do this, that only push out rare updates. And they see a nice jump when they push out the update, but they've lost so much of their momentum. So many of their players have moved on to other games that it doesn't matter. The ones that do it regularly, that keep the players engaged, are the ones that have the better long-term success. Uh, one thing that you can do to kind of help with this, especially if you're running out of ideas for new content, is play off of seasonal and holiday events. Do things that are uh, relative to the players, uh, you know, what, there's, what they're doing in real life. Uh, it can be holidays. It could also be, you know, if the World Cup is going on or Olympics. If it makes sense for your game, you can bring those in as well. Uh, this game, Bushwhacker 2, uh, it's actually a little too casual for Congregate, but it has amazing retention because they're really, really good at doing events like this. Uh, this was a, a Halloween event from last year where they just built this haunted house, uh, or built this empty house, and you as a player b haunted it and then scared kids. Uh, and that was entirely unique for the event, but all the players logged in, saw this really cool thing, and got really engaged with it. And they do this every two months. Though something new will come out, and they retain users better than almost any other game on the site. Guilds, guilds, guilds. You'll hear us say this over and over. It's uh, if you can imagine Steve Ballmer, you know, tromping up and down. Guilds, guilds, guilds. Um, it's really important, and we talk about it a lot in, in Congregate talks. Um, every single one of our top games has guilds in it. Okay, this is it's really, really important for the top games to perform. And it's, there's a good reason. I mean, they're incredibly powerful late game tools. We were talking about how retention, late game retention is really, really important. This is one of the best ways to get late game retention uh, up. They create strong personal bonds with other players. This is a social event, okay? Single player games have some success, but they don't have the long-term retention of multiplayer because you don't have these social connections. We as humans, we like interacting with other people, competitively and cooperatively, and guilds enable that. They encourage high level and deep competition between uh, players and between guilds. So you're working with your guild mates to try to outperform the other guilds. You're engaging with the game. You're coming back more often, not just to play the game, but to keep your guild up at the top, right? You have this, this social obligation to return to the game. And that can even convert over to purchasing. I'm spending money to improve myself so that I can contribute better to my guild. It, and it's a positive loop where I, am, you know, I get this great feeling because my guildmates are happy I'm spending money because I'm helping the guild. So it's, it's this really great positive atmosphere for everybody. Uh, we did a quick study at one point that, said, uh, that discovered that players that join guilds are 10 to 20 times more valuable than those who don't. It, it really is very powerful. Uh, I did a talk in GDC Europe um, this just a, a few months ago specifically about guild design. If you're interested in it, um, you can check out our website. We have it posted there. Uh, and I go into a lot more depth about you know, how to design a guild for a game. Um, I'm running out of time. I'll get through this last few slides here. Uh, percentage of big spenders. So here's an interesting question. What percentage of spending users in your game spend at least $1,000? So we'll go back to our bubble chart here. And uh, now, the, the only thing that's different is this x-axis is now the percentage of paying users who spend at least $1,000. And you'll notice uh, that these, the, the top performing games are often, sorry, these are really small numbers, but this is 2% up to about 7%, 8% here, are spending, of paying users are spending at least $1,000, all right? Uh, and again, it's a very small sample size, but the Eastern European games we have so far are a little bit lower on this list. Um, and it turns out you know, that may be by design that uh, you know, they're trying to monetize uh, more off of quantity than quality, and that can certainly work uh, for some audiences. But for, for Congregate and for some Western audiences, uh, it's a little bit different, and here's why. This is a breakdown of all of the spending users on Congregate and broken down by what category they're in. So you see about half of users that spend money spend less than $10 on Congregate. Uh, another quarter spend 10 to 50 and then they get really, really thin until these top two slices here uh, are $500 to $1,000 and more than $1,000. And each one of those is about 2% of paying users. And all paying users are only about 2 to 3% of the audience. So it's a very small percentage of users. But now if you look at their contribution to the revenue, the chart completely flips. So that little 2% sliver up here of greater than 1,000 is responsible for more than 50% of the revenue on the site. This is a very, very big spender driven um, industry. It's driven by quali quality over quantity. The 50% you know, of people who are spending less than $10 are making up this tiny little sliver, about 2% of your revenue. So focusing the game, thank you, uh, making sure your game uh, 
making sure your players can spend at least $1,000 in a meaningful way in your game is very important. Otherwise, you're leaving money on the table. You have players who want to spend this much money in your game, but if they can't do it in a way that makes sense, that is productive, that is meaningful for them, they're not going to. Uh, a couple of quick points. I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, avoid fine-grained pricing. Uh, I've seen this in a few Eastern European games. It may be a coincidence, but I've only seen it in Eastern European games, so I wanted to mention it just in case uh, you know, it's an intentional design decision. Uh, we see currency conversions that give players complete control over how they convert. So as an example, um, this is our currency, and they let the player say how many creds they want to spend, and then they convert it directly over to the in-game uh, hard currency. So I, as a player, can pick out exactly how much I want to spend in the game. Now, why is this a problem? First off, it limits your ability as a salesperson to upsell to a bigger um, package. So you have to remember that you're, this is a service, and you're selling, right? Any opportunity that you have to sell to your players, to encourage them to spend more money, and be happy about spending more money. You're not trying to trick them. You're just giving them the opportunity. You want to be able to take that opportunity as a salesman. Uh, second, they're only going to purchase exactly how much they need. I'm never going to buy more than I need if I have complete control over this because I know exactly what I want. The result is that I'm going to limit my spending, I'm not going to have a balance in my account, and next time I want to spend money, I have to go through this process again. I'm adding more friction to my, uh, to my purchasing process because of this. A better, s um, I'll get through these quickly. So a better model is to break sales into a few per a, a few packages. Uh, so here we have Cloudstone, and they only have six packages, and they give you bonuses based on going up to larger packages. Uh, in this way, you as a player say, "Oh, well, I could buy this one, but I actually get an extra five. I'm sorry, that's really small on this. Um, but you actually get better deals as you spend more money. Uh, they'll also build in a, uh, a special deal for first-time buyers, so you can increase your uh, buyer percentage. Uh, and then throwing in a bunch of great stuff for the big spenders is really effective here. Uh, so this is from Dragons of Atlantis. Uh, and you'll see they have these like plus 40 free items. This bottom one says plus 148 free items if I buy the biggest package. And if you put your mouse over that, you get this great list of all this cool stuff that you get entirely for free just for buying this big package on top of all of your uh, hard currency. And you as a spender would say, well, I know I can, get, I can spend those rubies on something, and I get all this cool stuff, and maybe I'll go ahead and buy the bigger package. Uh, almost done. Um, so that's how to get a, a bigger individual sale, but how do you get them coming back? So in addition to the more content, you can also gamify continued spending. So you provide incentives for bigger spenders to make continued purchases. It's like a frequent flyer miles or uh, a loyalty program. Uh, it's often called a VIP program in games. Um, this is an example from Pocky Pirates. And you'll notice you have this looks like an experience bar. That's actually a spending bar. So as you're spending money, you're filling up this bar, and you actually level up your spending level. Uh, and you get these bonuses as you level up. So they've, they've actually produced a game around spending money in the game, and it keeps people coming back and spending more money. Um, and they're actually happy about it, because now I've spent more money, I get these cool new bonuses, and I'm getting currency and buying things the whole time. So it's this great, just kind of happy loop for everybody. Okay, uh, key takeaways. Long-term retention and engagement is very, very important. Uh, you want to keep players coming back with your new content and events, seasonal events, holiday events, anything you can do there. Provide incentives to purchase larger packages and then keep making those purchases. Uh, and then find ways to spend at least you know $1,000. And in some cases, we're having players spend tens of thousands of dollars in games. You want to make sure that that's possible in your game if the player wants. OK. Um, I think it was a couple minutes over. But uh, so thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me directly at anthony at congregate.com. Um, if you visit our developer's site, we have a lot of these talks posted. Uh, so you can uh, check them out there. And then here's some contact information uh, if you have any questions. All right, thank you. I'm not sure why you thought you were going over. You're fine. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. I must have said that wrong then. But okay. That's OK. <laughs> so uh, by my clock, we have about five minutes left. Oh, good. <laughs> there were a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. OK. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to clarify, for those of you who were taking snapshots of the slides, after the show, you can download the slides from the Casual Connect site. And as you can see, you can also email Anthony and get his slides. So if you can't see what was on that photo, make, sh make sure you get a copy of the presentation. The second thing that I was going to say that was related to something that you said at the beginning is that <coughs> variations on this theme have been presented by Congregate in the past. So if you look on the San Francisco website from this summer, 
you'll see Emily Greer doing a presentation kind of like this, but focuses on things like statistical re regression to determine correlation in data, which was awesome. Emily is a very smart lady. Um, and then David Chu did a similar presentation in Singapore for Casual Connect, where he talked about why Asian uh, why Asian games seem to do better than other games from other uh, locales. And both of those are available on video <coughs> on the Casual Connect sites if you want to go and review them. And then the last thing that I wanted to point out was there's, a, there's an underlying message that, that Anthony didn't say specifically, but it's really important related to this presentation, and that's know your audience. Congregate has a very specific, highly qualified, mid-core and hardcore online game monetizing audience. And so when he talks about people spending $1,000 in his game, of course that's pot or you know, all of the bulk of the revenue coming from players who spend more than $500 in their game. That's actually unique to Congregate in some ways. And so while this presentation is fantastic for thinking about how you're going to develop a mid-core or hardcore game for Congregate, one of the takeaways for those of you who aren't developing a mid-core or hardcore game for Congregate is that the analysis that he did, the numbers that he showed, and the way that they're thinking about their audience is, is applicable to any channel where your game might be. So you may find out that 80% of your revenue comes from people who spend 80 to $110 in your game and you really want to get those players. Um, the important thing to realize is that they're driving these decisions based on real players doing real things in real games. And it's really important to think about your games that way. With that, I want to open the floor for any questions that you might have for Andrew or for um, Anthony. Questions? Do you see any questions? I don't see any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much then. Thanks for flying all the way to Kiev. <laughs>